food for your brain and your body. Kind of a cool topic, right? Now, at this point in the day, being at the end, it's nice because I get to summarize a little bit of what everybody else has already said, and then hopefully add some new tidbits on what else you can do to specifically get that brain up and running. Because ultimately, without a good brain, it's kind of like without a good heart, the quality of life just isn't so good as the decades go by. So we want to make sure that your brain is really running at the very top notch it can. We want lots of plasticity. We want lots of function. We want the ability for that noggin to learn new things all day, every day. And that's called plasticity as those brains and those neurons grow new synapses. And with that, we want that brain to be excited to learn new things, to be motivated to learn new things, to want to eat good food and get out there in the world and socialize and be happy and be productive human beings. That's a good, healthy brain. How do we do that from a food perspective? Well, we mentioned already a little bit about the GI tract today. You've heard a couple things about this, right? And I'm not sure who's shown what pictures because he can't attend all the sessions, but that GI tract is an amazing system, right? It's run somewhere in the order of 26, 27 feet long from top to bottom. Now that alone just stretched out is pretty good, but what if you actually took these different layers, right? These are called plique and villi, and these are folded in. The whole system has a bunch of folds on it. And what if you were to take it and spread it out flat? How large of an area would your intestines cover if you were to be thinking in terms of sports analogies? Somewhere around, well, it depends how, how spread out you actually do it. If you just go and you kind of open up the individual plique, it's about a doubles tennis court. And if you open up all the individual villi and microvilli, you start to go towards a football field. So the square footage that is present in those 26, 27 feet of intestines is immense. And guess what? We need to do good things to keep that square footage happy and healthy. We need to be good realtors of our square footage of our intestines. And part of that means we need to feed good things. And what is that? Well, it's different a little bit for everybody. But the one thing that should have come through strong today, regardless of what type of special diet you feel you may need to be on, is to avoid what? What type of foods? GMOs, right? If we can buy organic, where we know the different genetics that make up those foods have not been altered, because two of the big things that the two primary types of GMO foods do, and it's one of two different modulations, is either they contain different types of strains of DNA that poke holes in the stomachs of insects' bugs, and that's how they kill insects. And originally they said, oh, that's not going to hurt humans. Our stomach acid will take care of that, no problem. We won't actually be using that type of food genetic code. And guess what? It's now found in over 80% of all women and men. It's even pregnant women, and it's even in your cord blood. So it can contribute to something called leaky gut syndrome. And we're going to look at pictures of kind of what that is as we get to know that. And that's how we develop a lot of food allergies. And as soon as we have that going on, that's not cool for our brain at all. The second thing that happens is we've got Roundup Ready crops, right? Now, the concept of Roundup Ready crops is lovely. But the reality is that what happens to those plants when you actually ingest them is that they disturb the flora of our gut. What's the flora? I tend to ask a lot of questions when I talk. All right, it's the bacteria that live in our gut. You have this common symbiosis, your symbiotic effect. You actually have a whole lot more pathogens living on you right now and different bacteria. We're nothing but par you know, parasites. That's all that's happening here. So how many pounds of good bacteria, if you have a healthy colon, should you have in those 26 feet? Three to five pounds. Think about that size, a bag of bacteria, and they're all little teeny tiny, right? Roundup kills a lot of those, and these Roundup Ready crops. So is it important to actually be on things like probiotics on a semi-regular basis to refill against some of those things? Because you know what? You've got multiple different things now that are all Roundup Ready, and wheat is not one of them yet, by the way. Uh, it's a common misconception. That one has not been cleared, but soybean is, and there's a lot of other ones that are. And it's hard to get away from all the oils and things that are Roundup Ready. And so they're constantly attacking our, our in, inflammation, I'm sorry, our inflammation, our little uh, interior digestive tract that is these good microbes. And we need to give it good probiotics all the time. So if we zoom in a little bit more here, 
Just FYI, the small intestines, they do the majority of the work, okay? The stomach acid that's in the stomach is gonna start breaking things down. It actually starts the moment you smell food, you actually kick into digestion mode. You start releasing saliva, your saliva starts breaking down different carbohydrates and starches. Then it finally hits your stomach, the acid there starts to kick it down, and then it goes into the intestines. And the small intestine does the majority of the work initially. It's really what's going to break down and digest with enzymes, so much of those whole foods. And then from there, it's gonna pull new nutrients out. By the time you get to that large intestine, which is the blue part that loops around, kind of looks like an upside down U, right? That's your colon and eventually it becomes your rectum on the very bottom there, that little pointer. By the time you get to that, you're not absorbing a lot of nutrients out of there. That's mostly evacuation and you want to suck more water up through that portion. So you're doing the last little bit of staying hydrated and then elimination. That's what the large intestine does primarily. Pretty cool. If we zoom in on this, and this is more of a small intestinal zoom, we talk about this whole intestinal permeability or leaky gut syndrome. And so if we know that certain types of GMO foods can increase permeability in our intestinal tract, we wanna do things to keep these synapses, these junctions of how these cells glue together real tight. We don't want them to open up. And when they start to open up, then we start to get problems. And we'll show you a close-up slide of this here in just a second that has a little opening in there. This is complicated. On the top, you have your gut lumen. That's where all your food would be. And this would be an example of the folding of one of your intestinal small areas, right? One of your little villi. That little piece that's coming up from the bottom there actually is a blood vessel. And you have a whole bunch of lymphatic drainage as well. So the amount of work that your intestines are doing all day, every day, to not only get nutrients out of your food, but furthermore, and almost equally important, keep bugs from getting into your bloodstream is awesome and you want to be very good to your intestines for that reason. Why do we say, and this was part of the description today, that 80% of your immune system comes from your gut? Where does that come from? Literally, if you look at the lymphatic tissue, you guys know what lymphatics are, right? This is where your lymph nodes come in. All your tonsils are your first line of defense in the back of your throat, they're your big lymph nodes, but you have lymphatic systems all over your body that their job is to suck garbage out and get rid of it. It's either gonna pump it out through your stool or through your bloodstream and eventually through your kidneys and you're gonna pee it out and poop it out. Those lymphatic systems, the vast majority of them are called gut-associated lymphatic tissues, GALT. And we need those systems to be very healthy to get rid of pathogens that we really shouldn't be having in our body as well as inflammatory aspects. If we have increased intestinal permeability where all of a sudden some of these cells start to open up, and I know they don't want me to do this, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Right here. This big gut opening right here. So you've got tight junction, tight junction, tight junction. You've got this mucosal membrane, okay? That tight junction is great. It needs a healthy mucosal membrane over the top of it. Mucosal membrane is your mucus, right? It's your, in your nose, it's your snot. In your mouth, it's your saliva. Um, and in your intestines, it's a thicker mucus and there's different nutrients that can feed that mucus. Marshmallow root is actually one of the best in them, right? So you can find teas that have marshmallow root and it helps improve mucus membrane health and can calm down your intestinal tract. In that mucosal membrane, you see all those blue little dots? Those are your good bacteria. Those are your probiotics that live there and they fight off the bad bacteria that you're gonna be getting through what? How do we get exposed to these bad bacteria? Where does it come from? Does it come from our food? Yeah, some of it does, right? If we don't wash things well enough, that's possible. Or we don't cook them all the way, that's possible. Where else does it come from? How would it end up in our intestines? How do bacteria and viruses end up in our intestines? You either eat it or you swallow it. Right? If you breathe it, it goes in through your nose and then it still hits the back of your throat and you swallow some of that stuff. Or it comes in through your mouth, through your mouth breather, and you swallow some of that. And then of course, whatever ends up in your lungs is associated with other lymphatic tissue that drains your lungs, so that's good. We need healthy mucosal membranes first so that all the good probiotics you're going to then take down in supplement form work well. And then you should be able to have 
nice, healthy mucosal membranes as a first line of defense, coupled with hopefully tighter junctions because you're avoiding things like GMO foods and you're eating other types of foods such as higher fiber foods, right? And less pro-inflammatory foods, which we'll talk about in just a minute, which keep those mucosal membranes healthy and those junctions tight. If those junctions open up, now all of a sudden partially digested foods that can especially the protein portions of foods make it from your lumen where the gut and the food should be there on the top down through the cells and where do they end up next into your bloodstream and when they're in your bloodstream guess what they do they cause all kinds of inflammation and now your immune system gets in the game now it's not just your digestive tract now your immune system gets in the game and says is this a friendly type of particle or is this not a friendly type of particle? And it will produce antibodies to protect you. So this is where the idea of food sensitivity tests come from. If you test somebody's blood and you're producing high amounts of antibodies to a specific antigen or a food protein, maybe you need to stop eating that food for a while, right? While we heal your gut. The goal is not to have you be on an elimination diet for the rest of your life. If you can heal the intestinal membranes by taking away the most pro-inflammatory foods short term and give yourself lots of good things like probiotics and fish oils and fiber, vitamin D, these things can help heal our digestive tract and then you might be able to go back and reintroduce some of the foods that you love most. You're just going to try to introduce them as organic as possible, right? Does that make sense so far? Now. Just because we produce antibodies to a food doesn't mean that's a bad thing. And that's something that's come under a lot of scrutiny in recent times. Should everybody do food allergy testing? No, you don't have to do food allergy testing. You can do elimination diets and just try going gluten free. How long do you need to try it for? At least three months. This whole two, three week thing does not work. Now I will celebrate the daylights out of if you feel better in two to three weeks, awesome. But do not dare give up on that diet if it hasn't changed in two to three weeks. Give it three months, whether it's gluten-free, dairy-free, or otherwise. Because you need that long for some of these antibodies to calm down. IgG food sensitivity tests, uh, which are some of the more common ones and more cost-effective ones, to just look at one little type of immune system response. Right? And there's lots of different types of immune system responses. But IgG being pretty cost effective, those antibodies can stay elevated for upwards of nine months after food exposure. So do you think taking it away for two weeks might make you feel like a million bucks? It might, but the chances are slim. So give yourself a little bit more time than that. Start slow and easy. Be kind to yourself while you start to do these things. And really judge it after three months. And what I tell all my patients, whether they're a pediatric a case that's in the office or whether they're an adult is, guess what? After three months, if you're not quite sure whether it's helping, go out and have a blowout day. So if you've been dairy free the last three months, head on down to COPS. Start your day with a nice bagel and cream cheese, and I mean big schmear. I want like three quarters of an inch on that thing, okay? I used to live, I was in New York the first 10 years that I practiced, I want a big old thing of cream cheese on there. And then enjoy some pizza for dinner, and now, don't eat it again the next day, see how you feel for the next week. Because it may not hit you the first 24 hours, but it might hit you at 36, 72 hours, something like that, and see how it goes, and then you'll really know just how dangerous that food was to you during that time. So when we get to start to talk about what we're putting into this lumen, right? We've got the probiotics in there, that's helping a lot. We've got high fiber foods that help scrub out our mucosal membrane and keep our mucus healthy, that's great. We understand that things like marshmallow tea can be very calming and soothing to that mucosal membrane. So we can drink some nice easy marshmallow tea if we feel like our digestive tract doesn't work so well and it'll help our probiotics do a better job. And now, we sit here and go, okay, it's fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So you heard from multiple sources already, different types of fats, right? And what are some of the more beneficial fats for our body and our brain? Coconut, Coconut oil is fantastic. Avocado. Avocado sources are wonderful. Olive oil. Olive oil is terrific, yep. How about nuts? Nuts are wonderful. What about animal fats? You don't want to just say things are good or bad because animal fats may be just fine for you as an individual. They're going to be more of an omega-6 type of fatty acid as long as they're clean fats. You heard a little bit this morning about where we store toxins in our body. Where do we store toxins in our body? What type of cells? Fat cells, right? 
So if we eat animals that have a higher type of fat content in their meat and they were not fed an organic diet, guess what you just ate? A whole bunch of toxins, right? That are stored in their fat and now they're your fat. So we just need to keep that in mind. You know, you heard, um, I think it was Dr. Riggs talk about just start with organic dairy if you're gonna start with anything, right? And you heard Dr. Schwartz say dairy's probably the most pro-inflammatory food for the vast majority of us because we're not little cows, right? We're humans and we're not designed to drink cow's milk all the time like little cows are. So dairy's really important and I would second that with any animal product being organic, especially meats of animals, okay? So just really, really important. If they're certified organic, they had to be fed an organic feed. That's how that works. That's really important. Um, okay, so all fats are not equal. There's pro-inflammatory fats, like these omega-6s that come from more animal proteins, and you don't want to eat a ton of those. You want to limit those a little bit. And then what are the other really good ones that we talked a little bit about? We mentioned some of the omega-9s, like olive oil and coconut oil, and then there are Omega-3s, the ones that get all the press, right? And there's uh, both vegetable sources of those, which are flaxseed, and then there's animal sources of those, and the most common animal source for omega-3s is? Fish oil. Okay, so when we talk about fish oil, how much do you need to start helping have an anti-inflammatory effect and a healthy brain effect? What does the research say? So it's broken down into two subgroups, EPA and DHA, right? And these two omega-3s have a lot to do. DHA helps our brain a little bit more, it seems. EPA has more of a peripheral anti-inflammatory effect, more of a cardiovascular effect. Both of them are really important. Are you gonna get some benefit if you just do, say, a gram a day or a thousand milligrams? You bet, you'll get some. But more and more in the literature, as you look through it as the years go by, and there's been so many great studies on fish oils, if you get up towards three to five grams a day, you get a lot more kick. So I start everybody on five grams a day in my practice. And the easiest way that I've found to get five grams a day that's cost effective and actually tastes good is a company called Barleans. B-A-R-L-E-A-N-S. They make great flax oil if you like to use flax on your salads. But they make a terrific fish oil that's very cost effective and actually is nice and thin. It doesn't coat your whole mouth. Just called their signature orange fish oil. So the one of the cheaper fish oils they make. And from that, you can use about a tablespoon of that a day, and you'll get almost five grams a day of DHA and EPA in a tablespoon. Very cost effective. So one of the best things for your brain, if I was stuck on an island and people said, you only can choose one thing to have on that island for brain health, as much as Dr. Shetty the dentist said maybe it should be my dentist, and there was anybody in Dr. Shetty's group, they were talking about integrative medicine practitioners because of just how much you can tell them somebody's health from their teeth. And having a good dentist is really important. Um, but if it was a supplement, it would be fish oil. Because honest to God, when you look at the amount of fat that the nervous system comprises, how much of the nervous system is made of fat? Upwards of 80 to 90% of it is just fat. You need these good fats for your brain to be healthy. So very important. Plus, they have an anti-inflammatory effect. So take your fish oils. Fish oils and probiotics, must do, must do. Does it have to be every single day? No, if you're pretty healthy, you could probably just do them a couple times a week, as long as it's a decent sized dose. Bad fats, we went through some of the animal side effects that might happen if they're not fed great food. That's not so terrific. And uh, guess what type of food, if it's carbs, proteins, or fats, helps us feel satiated? You have to have fats. Why did everybody start gaining weight on low-fat diets and fat-free diets 15 to 20 years ago? Everyone was hungry all the time. <laughs> Coupled with, <laughs> I felt so good, I ate a low-fat diet. Yeah. And what happened to your blood sugar? We'll talk about that in a second. Power proteins, you gotta have some nice proteins. Now, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you can still certainly get proteins from other sources other than animal proteins, so I'm not saying that you have to eat animal proteins, but you know, in general, if you were to think about how things have evolved over the last couple thousand years, did we used to eat more proteins and less carbs? You bet we did. And now we eat a whole lot more carbs and a whole lot less proteins um, and less fats than before. So we want to shift that around again and cut down on those carbs. And you've heard that from everybody. I'm sure Juliana spoke on that earlier a little bit in terms of what should be on your plate, right? And bump up more of the, the fiber and the vegetables and the fruits to a lesser extent and some good protein sources. Different benefits of protein. Proteins are made of amino acids. 
And amino acids, you've got 20 of them in your body. Some of them are essential, meaning you have to get them from your food. If you don't get them from your food, you can't make them on your own through chemical reactions. Some of them you can swap around chemical reactions. What do you, what's one of the main things you need amino acids for in your body as protein building blocks? Heals your tissues, helps with hormones and neurotransmitters. You need these amino acids all the time. And you've heard a little bit about hormones today. Not too much, right? A little bit about stress hormones. We haven't talked a whole lot about sex hormones at all. Uh, I don't think anyone's mentioned sleep hormones like melatonin, which is really more of a neurotransmitter than it is a hormone. But these hormones require really good amino acids. And so that does come from protein in your diet. So for the people that are just eating a very, very high carbohydrate diet, it becomes hard for your brain to feel its best, secondary to poor function of hormone and neurotransmitter synthesis. When you look at how hormones are really made, what's the precursor molecule that filters down to all your other hormones, sex hormones, stress hormone, cortisol, cholesterol. So we have to be very careful when we think about dropping people's cholesterol too low. Even though that's, you know, right, there were new guidelines out about 10 days ago. Here's the new guidelines for statin drugs. We have to be careful with this because if we drop cholesterol too low, guess what types of symptoms skyrocket? Depression and mood disorders in general and suicide risk. So guess what number in the literature your risk for those types of mood disorders and lifestyle risks start to go. If your cholesterol is less than what number? Anywhere between 150, 160, right? Now when I was in school, I've been practicing 15 years here starting January. When I was in school, started in school, 240 was your cholesterol number. That was your red flag. If you were hitting 240, you need to start thinking about it and start watching it. By the time I graduated, it was 220. And then it quickly became 200. And it's still mostly 200, but we're starting to creep around the 180s. We have to be careful dropping that cholesterol because you will tank all of your other hormone synthesis. Every cell in your body requires cholesterol. The cell membranes are made up of fat. We need lots of cholesterol. And what you're going to see happen over the next, hopefully 10 years, uh, preferably sooner, but for sure over the next 10 years is there'll be, and there already are starting to be books called The Cholesterol Myth which is to say that you don't necessarily have an increased risk of heart disease just due to your total cholesterol count. There are subfractions of cholesterol that you need to look at, density, size, uh, et cetera, and really break down these. So there's fancier and fancier blood tests now that will become the standard of care, which will show who's really at risk for these types of uh, scenarios in terms of cardiovascular risk factors. And things like probiotics, things like clean food, things like fish oil can change some of those. Things like exercise can change your risk factors depending upon where you fall with different cholesterol reads on these fancier lipid panels. So you want to start asking for these fancy lipid levels. All right, so is organic important now based on the whole animal protein story? You bet, it's huge. And that dirty dozen and clean 15 that you saw Dr. Schwartz throw up tonight, tonight, this morning, <laughs> he was kind of first, wasn't he? I'm tonight. He, he threw that up. Do you remember the slide towards the very end? It had a little cell phone and it had the dirty dozen and the clean 15. There's a new cell phone app by the Environmental Working Group. Download that app. It allows you with your, your, with your camera on your phone to scan the barcode and it gives you an instant rating for foods, for cosmetics. Yeah. Environmental Working Group is the name of the group. EWG.org. They're the ones that make that list. Environmental Working Group. And they've been talking about this app for a long time and I think it just launched in the last two weeks. And my wife was using it in the grocery store this week and she said, this is the best. She called me all excited. This Environmental Working Group app is the best. I can scan things at the grocery store and even stuff that's on our shelves and get an instant toxicity read. They rate things based on carcinogen effect. Toxic load based on potential to cause cancer. Cancer's a good marker because it means your cells are really injured, right? So um, these chemicals that have been researched that are known to be carcinogenic in nature go into the database and then all of a sudden things that you thought were clean maybe weren't so great for you. So you might want to limit their use or find healthier alternatives. The cosmetic database is great. The sunscreen database is great. And then of course their food database on what to buy organic really, really important. So you can limit your load of toxicity and pesticides and herbicides 
just by going with that whole dirty dozen. If you buy that top dirty dozen list organic, I believe the percentage that you'll minimize your exposure to those types of chemicals is something like 70%. It's very dramatic. And other things that we eat don't soak up those pesticides and herbicides the same way, or they're not sprayed as much, or they're sprayed with different types of chemicals, and you don't have to worry about them quite as much. So get to know the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15, um, and think about that when you're at the store. If we have carbohydrate, or I'm sorry, if we have fats plus proteins, it really helps satiety because of how we affect blood sugar. So we didn't talk too much about insulin and glucose, but you heard diabetes mentioned a couple times. And there's something that's called the glycemic index. And more and more when we look at the health of the brain and how it ages and chronic degenerative diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's, which are increasing, though there's still a small percentage of the population that has them, nonetheless they are increasing in nature, we're realizing that a lot of these disease factors start how many years before they actually show up symptomatically? Decades. Upwards of 30 years prior to onset of symptoms with Alzheimer's, your brain is going through inflammatory changes. It's changing the way that it detoxes. One of the newest research, and you heard a little bit about sleep, and those of you that have stopped by, you saw my booth out there on insomnia and sleep today. One of the biggest new breakthroughs on sleep in the last month was, guess what your brain does while it's sleeping? It detoxes. Awesome, because we sit there and say, well, why does the brain really need to sleep? Well, it's nice to rest. It gives us more energy during the day. Yeah, but why? Why does the body really need to rest? We've never really figured that out yet. And that's brand new, hot off the presses. There is increased detoxification, increased dumping, less inflammation in the brains of animals that sleep well versus animals that are not allowed to sleep. Cool, so go to bed. You'll not only burn somewhere on the order of 70 to 80 calories an hour sleeping, you won't be eating food, you'll lose weight, you'll reset your stress hormones, you'll detox your brain, and you'll have more energy the next day, which improves your attention and your mood and your ability to exercise and all those other things. Sleep is key. You have to start with sleep first for a healthy brain. And then, of course, feed it good things, like we were talking about here a little bit. Well, <clears throat> there's a Dr. Perlmutter down in Florida. How many of you guys have heard of Dr. Perlmutter? Yeah, a couple of you. And he just came out with a new book in the last two months called Grain Brain. He's a neurologist. Grain Brain. And he talks a lot about how glycemic index of food is so very important for the aging of the brain and how with high glycemic index foods and high carbohydrates and high sugars, we change the way that we release different chemicals within our body and we tend to cause inflammation. So if you eat lots of foods that are high on the glycemic index chart, you will have an increased amount of inflammation, not only systemically in your body, which can lead to what type of symptoms? If you're inflamed, what might you experience in your body? Arthritis. Arthritis, muscle pain, headaches, inability to bounce back after a workout, weight gain, weight gain fatigue, and poor mood. And your attention will be really in the garbage. Your, your working memory, your short-term memory will just tank. Well, some of this crosses over and it crosses the blood-brain barrier and we start to get inflammatory markers in our brain, which means if our brain's sleeping well, maybe it can detox some of that at night, right? But if our brain's not sleeping well, now the brain and all these different cells within the brain, the supportive cells, undergo chronic inflammation. And this is some of where different aspects of dementia and Alzheimer's start to come in. So one of my favorite things to note on here is always potatoes. A Little hard to see on this screen here. But what do you see with those potatoes? They're coming in at 98. Pure glucose is 100, right? Pure glucose sugar. And then where's your sweet potatoes? Do you guys find the sweet potatoes on there? 51. 51. So which potato do you want to eat when you order potatoes? Sweet potatoes. sweet potatoes. Why? Is there a lot more nutrients in it? There's some, right? And what's the bigger benefit? It doesn't spike your blood sugar levels as much because of its glycemic index. It's less inflammatory. So very important for how your brain and your immune system are going to have to respond, as well as how much insulin you're going to have to pump out to actually process that sugar that's in that food. And that gets into diabetes. One of my other favorite things to pump out here, and it'll be great that you guys have access to all these slides. Um, this one came from a website called AskDrDanny.com, but there's lots of these different charts out there. I just happened to borrow this one. Look at white and wheat bread on the left-hand side. Which one scores worse on glycemic index? 
Whole wheat is higher than white. Oops. So we think we're doing well, and maybe we are in terms of additional nutrients that are in whole wheat bread, but there's a downside to the glycemic index of it and how we process it and what it does to our blood sugar. So let's be careful. What's one of the best ways to minimize the effect of a food on blood sugar? If you're going to go and you're going to eat potatoes, what should you pair it with to minimize how much is going to spike your blood sugar? Fiber and some protein, but especially fiber. Fiber will slow down how quickly you absorb all that stuff from your lumen. So big salad. With a potato and steak, not a bad idea. Great idea, actually. Food sensitivities. Now, we've gone through this a little bit. The cheapest way to do food sensitivity testing on yourself is just to eliminate it. Just pull it out, right? And if you really want to do a massive elimination <laughs> diet, you'll do a gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, corn-free, preservative-free, colorant-free, sugar-free type of diet. And that's hard for a lot of people to do. Oh, yeah, it'll be alcohol-free, too and probably chocolate free. So you're left, I know, right? Don't take away the chocolate. Now, personally, I'm a softie. So I tend to say, let's figure out what we think the most pro-inflammatory food is. Some of that you can do based on symptoms. If you have chronic congestion, and you actually heard Dr. Shetty, the dentist, mention this earlier. If you are a mouth breather, and she sees it in terms of dry mouth presentations, poor enamel and carries along the gum line, etc., that's not normal. You should not be a mouth breather. If you are a mouth breather, whether it's during the day or at night while you're sleeping, you have nasal passage inflammation and you can't get enough air through your nose while you're sleeping or during the day. If that is the case, or if you're prone to seasonal types of allergies that are nose and rhinitis, or if you have chronic sinus infections, just take dairy out. Just try it. Cut it out for three months and see what happens. It's the casein that you have to look for. You have to read those labels and make sure there's no milk powder, make sure there's no casein, which is the big protein in milk that's hiding in there because they like to throw casein and caseinate in all kinds of foods because it makes foods taste good and it makes them creamy, right? And so we have a little bit of a satiety effect there. But that can help beneficially. IgG food sensitivity tests, these run um, generally on the order of somewhere in the 200s as far as dollars go. They'll usually test about 100 foods. There's finger prick tests. There's blood draw tests. There's a couple saliva tests. I don't prefer those as much. I just don't think they're as accurate. Um, and again, we remember just because you have high IgG to a certain category of food, I'm looking for the category. Is it the dairy, ca dairy category? Is it the grain category? Is it the grains that contain wheat? Is it more you know, soybeans? Is it corn? Is it citrus? What's the category of foods that you're producing the most antibodies to? Based on the antibodies, that doesn't mean that that food's out for the rest of your life. It could just mean that right now your immune system is producing a lot of antibodies to protect you every time you eat that food. Either way, that food right now is stimulating your immune system and making it work very hard to produce lots of these antibodies. And that chronic antibody response is going to make you tired and fatigue you, and it comes at an inflammatory effect. So you remove the most pro-inflammatory food group. So while I was out in New York, I was in Midtown Manhattan. I'm a Milwaukee guy originally. <laughs> So it's nice to be back these last four years. I'm in Glendale now with my practice. But I was in Midtown Manhattan for a decade. And, and the East Coast, it was, hey, Scott, tell me why I need to eliminate this food. And once you tell me, I'm still not going to believe you. And you better flip and prove it to me. <laughs> All right, we'll prove it to you. Fine, we'll do a blood test. OK. In Wisconsin, it's, oh, if there's no possible way that dairy can hurt us. We are the Dairyland State. <laughs> so they're much nicer. Everyone's nicer about it. But we have the same problem. It's still prove it. So I do run food sensitivity panels here. I know that they're disputed sometimes, but they're pretty cost effective. And you get a chance to see just how hard your immune system's working. Now, the flip side to that is, is if your immune system's been working very, very hard fighting what you've been eating for years and sometimes decades, guess what happens to your immune system? It fatigues. It goes through something called senescence. It ages. It becomes less active. And so there are times where people that are so absolutely sensitive to different foods have pretty quiet test results. And in those cases, you just need to do a pretty massive elimination diet while you rebuild and replenish some of their mucosal membranes and their gut health. But that doesn't happen too often. Most people will pop up either being more of a grain gluten person or more of a dairy person with additional things that may you know, get thrown in there, like coffee and whatnot. 
once your gut's healthy, you can start to reintroduce that. So over the course of three, six, nine, 12 months, you can reintroduce those foods that you used to love so much. The general rule is whatever you love the most is probably hurting you, right? So I had a little boy in yesterday who was in brand new. He's 11 years old. Uh, he had chronic sinus infections at least twice a year, coupled with antibiotic use every time. That wasn't why he was in. He'd had five concussions in the past year and a half and had a headache since September. So mom wanted to help with headaches, but we get into this whole sinus thing. And I said, hey buddy, tell me a little bit about what you like to eat. And mom starts laughing and she goes, go ahead, tell him. <laughs> well, I just love milk. How much milk? At least a gallon a day. <gasps> I said, guess what? If you pull that, you probably won't have sinus infections. There's a good chance you won't have all this chronic stuffiness that you're sitting here with now. So. The things that we love most tend to hurt us, so all things in moderation, switch it around a little bit, don't eat everything all day, every day, right? And watch your immune system be able to moderate based on what's going in. Simple supplements for your brain. We've touched on fatty acids and fish oils, it's always my number one choice, right? Get up there at least in that one gram, preferably three, and really I think a lot of people benefit from even three to five grams per day of EPA plus DHA. High quality multivitamins and minerals, I actually use orthomoleculars, they make a great one called Alpha Base. They're one of the sponsors here today. That's still one of my favorite multivitamins, but there's a lot of great ones out there that are available at you know trusted health food stores like Outpost. Magnesium and zinc are really important. Magnesium, your nervous system uses it like crazy. Zinc is a cofactor in over 300 enzymatic reactions in your body. It's wonderful for your sense of smell. It's very immune boosting, especially in winter come cold and flu time. I want most people on some zinc, 25 milligrams, uh, usually a couple times a week, all right? And so zinc glycinate, G-L-Y-C-I-N-A-T-E is the most bioavailable. B vitamins, B vitamins, all the talk these recent uh, times have been whether or not they're activated. So activated B vitamins are methylated B vitamins, methylcobalamin, methylfolate, because a lot of us are missing SNPs in our genes that make it so that we can't take our regular B vitamins and methylate them properly. And if we can't methylate them, we can't use them per to, to produce neurotransmitters. We can't use them to detox as efficiently. We end up with a lot more inflammation and toxic load. So now, good B vitamins are methylated B vitamins, and you'll see it right on the back of the bottle. It'll be methyl tetrahydrofolate, methylcobalamin. You'll see methyl listed multiple times. Those are the ones you want, okay? Regardless of whether you have the genetic SNP or not, those will work a little bit better for you. B-complex? B-complex, yeah, nice B-complex. We tear through Bs like crazy. As soon as we're under stress, our nervous and endocrine system tear through B vitamins like mad. So yeah, nice B complex every day is a good idea. Vitamin D, huge. Everyone should get their vitamin D tested once a year. If you get it tested in the fall, right as summer's ending, that's probably the best your vitamin D level is gonna get throughout the year, right? If you test it in August or September, because you've been outside in the sun in the summertime. Some people think, well, I'm outside in the sun, I'm not gonna take my vitamin D in the summer. Well, unless you're running around naked all summer long in Wisconsin, you're not getting enough vitamin D. It's not happening. So, test your vitamin D levels. I like, it's preferred to do them in the fall, it doesn't matter really what time. Do them once a year and just see where you are. You wanna be over 60, okay? So that's our goal. Somewhere, usually it's rated up to 100, but it seems like the best immune system function happens, research-wise, when you get over 60. 60 to 70, maybe even as high as 80 or 90. Once you're over 100, we're tipping the scales, maybe towards a little bit too much toxicity. No one's been really reported with too much toxicity on a regular clinical basis, but just watch it. Most of us will test low. I prefer liquid vitamin Ds. I think they're more bioavailable. They're also cheaper. In general, they're very cost effective and they are absorbed a little bit sublingual and vitamin D levels skyrocket right up with some liquid vitamin Ds. Most individuals require about 5,000 IUs a day. If you have an autoimmune issue or a neurologic issue, then your vitamin D levels will usually be a lot higher in terms of what you need every day. But somewhere on that order of 5,000 a day in winter in Wisconsin is probably what benefits a lot of us. But have your levels tested. Base it on that first. Uh, probiotics. You can look around and see what you find. There's a couple really great brands out there. My favorite's always been Claire. That's what I've used for the last 12 years, but it's not the only one by any means. Claire spelled K-L-A-I-R-E. Um, you need billions of these guys in a serving. 
right? So you need somewhere usually on the order of 50 to 100 billion a day of different strains. You want lots of different strains of these bacteria. You have over 100 strains living in your gut. Most probiotics will only have two, three, four strains in them. Claire makes a couple formulations that are 10, 12 strains, which is nice. Antioxidants, A, D, E, K, CoQ10, and alpha lipoic acid. There's all types of research on the benefit of antioxidants to decrease inflammatory responses, improve how well your mitochondria inside of your cells, especially your neurons work and your cardiovascular system work. These are fantastic vitamins to get. You don't want to go crazy. These A, <laughs> D, E, and K are fat soluble vitamins. And we're missing a talk right now by John Whitcomb, but I'm sure we'll all watch it online, which is all the, about the importance of vitamin K and how it can help bone health, right? And so many other symptoms, so we'll watch that. We need those vitamins. CoQ10 is fantastic for heart health. It's also fantastic for brain health, as is alpha lipoic acid. It helps your cell membranes work better so that they can produce more energy and decrease toxic load as time goes on. So you can peek on those on brain health. We'll take questions after. Make a note. Fiber, super important just to help the health of that mucosal membrane. How often should you be having bowel movements? Uh, every meal. One or two a day. If you do three a day, okay, after every meal. But one or two, and easy, well-formed, enjoyable bowel movements. <laughs> Please. It should not be a chore to go to the bathroom. This is so important. It's a window into neurologic health. If you're constantly stressed, how do your bowels work? How does your GI tract work? Under chronic stress, your GI tract shuts down. You will be constipated, you'll have indigestion, you'll have gas, you'll have everything that's advertised on television. <laughs> so we can help the bowels by changing the nervous system through meditation, through exercise, through hormones and neurotransmitters and sleep. We can help the bowels by making sure we feed it well. And that can further help the nervous system. We all go through stages of stress, and I realize it's time to wrap this up here. But Everybody under acute stress spikes hormones and neurotransmitters, and then they quiet back down. Under chronic stress, they spike, they stay elevated for a while, and eventually systems fatigue. As they fatigue, in terms of hormones and neurotransmitters, our immune system tends to become a little more upregulated and busy. And that's not great for our gut, because now you have a double whammy. Under stress, you already shut your GI tract down right? Because you shunted all this blood into your muscles so that you could fight or flight. And that doesn't work well as the weeks and months under stress roll by. Now you have the double whammy of as you fatigue your adrenals and maybe your thyroid fatigues and your neurotransmitter systems fatigue, your immune system becomes dysregulated too and become much more active and pro-inflammatory in the interim. Eventually it poops out too. So that's not great. So one of the ways to protect the brain is to make sure that you do some things for stress response, right? Some of you have seen these fun goggles that I had out at the table that are meditation goggles with all these fun voiceovers. Meditate on your own. Go for 30 minutes of walking a day. Make sure you get good rest. Think good thoughts the moment you wake up in the morning and talk about how your day is going to go and think happy thoughts and be thankful for how the day went, even if it was a crappy day. Because <laughs> what you go to bed thinking is the last thing that's programmed not only into your subconscious, but that brain drives nervous system and drives sleep patterns and drives immune response. So, very important. We test people with hormones. We test people in neurotransmitters. We figure out what stage you're in. So if you've already changed your diet and you're helping heal your gut and you're giving it all the good stuff it needs to and you're still feeling like garbage, it's time for additional testing. You start to look at stress hormones, sleep hormones, sex hormones, and neurotransmitter levels, as well as food sensitivities and different GI panels to figure out what stage you're in. You can then start to come together and look to see how can we build better neurotransmitter systems. Let's use different, you know, <laughs> bases of helping you build better neurotransmitters, which will not only modulate things like chronic pain and mood and energy and sleep patterns, but can also make your immune system work better. And so there's a lot of research now going on neuroimmunology, how the immune system uses neurotransmitters, and guess what? The immune system actually manufactures its own neurotransmitters to communicate between immune cells as well as between the nervous system. So all of this is coming out in the research in terms of receptors and production. You're going to hear a lot about this, and this whole field is called neuroendoimmunology, and it's how the nervous system, the endocrine hormone system, and the immune system all play off of one another. The good news is, no matter how bad you feel, there's almost always another avenue into those systems, right? When we talk about food and diet and gut, we're talking about immune system. 
but it affects nervous system dramatically and it'll affect your hormone systems as well. You can look at neurotransmitter tests. They're performed at home, just FYI. If you're still feeling like garbage, you've done your elimination diet, maybe you've done your food sensitivity diet and you feel like you still have brain fog and you feel like your mood's still low and you're not sleeping well, what else can I do? You can do a urine neurotransmitter tests at home, send them off and you get an idea of where you're supposed to be in that middle zone that's gray here is where you kind of want to be in terms of output. This individual is an example uh, of a 51 year old male who just he falls asleep fine at 9.30 but just feels like he sleeps very light and he's just been exhausted for years. Uh, as an example here, he wakes up at 2 a.m., he's out of bed by 5 but doesn't feel like he falls back to sleep from 2 to 5. Wife says that he snores, he doesn't think he does. Um, that's where it's fun to run home sleep studies that actually show how much people snore. <laughs> and I've seen it both ways where all of a sudden, yeah, you snore like a freight train and you can see how many times a night they snore or they really don't snore much. They snore like three minutes a night. Well, it sure feels like a lot more, Scott. <laughs> All right, that's different. And that's a different stress response for the spouse, right? <laughs> Doesn't know what rested feels like anymore. He had changed his diet. He was already gluten-free and dairy-free. His wife had that family running so clean it wasn't even funny. And we finally got to a point where he's like, diet's not enough, it's not cutting it. How else can I help this? Because my attention is bad. I want to drink a whole pot of coffee every single day while I'm at work over the next seven hours. I know I can't sustain that. What else can we do? And you can see here with such a clean diet and a great proteins and anti-inflammatory diet, he's still running in the toilet with all these, right? So you want to start to give extra supplements so that he can produce more neurotransmitters on his own versus just using medications which shift the way you use neurotransmitters but don't help you make more on your own. So we want to get specific with that and we can guide that and that helps the brain age well. In summary, eat organic as often as you can. You're not going to be able to do it 100%. It's about minimizing your risk. Don't kick yourself when you can't do it. I travel a couple times a month on the road just to teach all this great neuroendoimmunology to practitioners all around the country. It's tough to eat well in hotels and airports. So I don't kick myself when I'm on the road, but at home we do gluten-free and dairy-free and it balances it out, right? As well as organic, enjoy eating, don't obsess about it, right? We don't want to, because the moment you start obsessing about what you're eating, you just caused your own stress response, which caused an immune response, which tanked your brain function. <laughs> so don't do that. Enjoy the food while you've got it. Don't feel bad about cheating if you want to cheat. That's fine. Have the food that you like. Just find healthier ways to do it, cleaner food ways to do it. Sleep well, so absolutely crucial. You learned about how it detoxes the system now, the nervous system. It regenerates all your hormones while you're sleeping so that you have healthy cortisol responses, better blood sugar levels, etc. So important for metabolism and weight and energy. We gotta have really solid sleep. And do you need less sleep as you age? No, you need the same amount of sleep as you age. You still need seven to eight hours to really maintain your health. So get off that bandwagon of, well, I'm just getting older. I don't need as much sleep, baloney because you do and no research that shows you don't. Um, supplements, we got probiotics, we got fiber, we got fish oil, we talked about vitamin D and other antioxidants for brain as well as gut, so very important. Additional testings there if you've already done your diet changes and you just still don't feel well and uh, choose happiness. Breathe deeply. You saw some of those breathing exercises that were outlined this morning, right? You breathe in for eight, hold it for a count of seven, breathe out for a count of, no, you breathe in for four, hold it for seven and breathe out for eight. I need to go do some breathing exercises <laughs> since it's the end of the day. And that automatically improves nervous system stress response and improves cortisol rhythm, takes you to a place of relaxation, improves immune health, and ultimately improves your brain function. I hope that's helped. It's the end of the day. I want to thank you guys for coming out and spending a long Saturday on a cold winter. I hope it's helpful. Give your feedback to the WIMS people that are out there. And thank you all for coming out. I'll stick around and answer questions as you need to. I'm not going to run out right away. All right? Thanks, guys. Thanks.